morning. I will begin my, my talk with a short, very short story of <coughs> variational principles in physics. So first of all was Snell, Snell or Snell's law. of refraction, but this is just a problem of the of a <coughs> quickest or shortest time, yeah? So imagine that we have a horseman here and he must go there and here there is a grass, which means that the horse may walk relatively fast with velocity V1, Whereas here we have a sand, velocity is much slower. So the first, uh, the, the, the first conjecture would be to choose the straight line, but it is obvious that it is not very, <coughs> it is not optimal, why? Because it pays to slightly shorten the, uh, Sorry, no, to slightly, yes, to slightly, uh, yeah, to sl slightly shorten the, <coughs> uh, the trajectory where the horse goes slowly, even if th this trajectory will be longer. So fi finally, there is some balance which must be fast. Of course, this problem is just a trivial, uh, problem in calculus, namely everything depends upon the uh, choice of the transition point, which means that the time is simply the uh, L1 divided by uh, V1, so this is a time which is necessary to make um, the first part of the trip, plus L2 divided by V2, and this is a function of this point, which let me call <coughs> X. So this is just a function of a single variable, and our students are <coughs> well prepared to calculate the minimum of that function. And as a result, we obtain the, the Snell law, namely, if I call this angle theta one and the other theta two. So the Stell law tells you that sine of theta one divided by sine of theta two is equal uh, V one by V two and that's all. <coughs> Sixteen sixty one. Now, next step is a Fermat uh, principle, namely <laughs> the trajectory of a light rain, uh, light rain uh, in a. So now is Fermat. So uh, the optic, uh, geometrical optics in non-homogeneous medium, which means that there is a medium whose velocity depends upon its position. X maybe, I will say X, just a position, even if it is, whether it is, Two-dimensional or three-dimensional, it doesn't matter. So the Fermat approach was the following. Let us approach, suppose we observe such a trajectory of a light ray. Let us approximate this curved trajectory by a, a polygonal chain, yeah, or polyline, which simply means that we divide this uh, medium into, into pieces such, such that the velocity is constant over them. And in that case, of course, there is a Snell law 
on each tra uh, transition point, which means that this time <coughs> depends not upon a single variable, but upon many variables. Yeah, so T, X, X, say one, X, two, and X. Jurek, I have a question. Yeah. Just crystal. Yes. So, uh, I mean, you said uh, th there is a snell low, uh, but of course, uh, because we take it for granted, but actually, uh, where does it come from? It's not obvious that there should be a snell low here for light. I We've been taught really that there is a principle like that. Question. Where it comes from, the Snell's law? Well, the, 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 the Snell's light. law comes from a uh, loop. For the light. But this is for a horse. But ah, why physically. Light know that it was it just assumed from? by the Snell, because people have observed already that there is some relation between sign and sign. <laughs> physically, they have measured and there have been conjectures that, but of course, at that time, nobody knew what is the velocity of line. So, in, but people were not happy with just uh, experimental measures, but were looking for, uh, for physical laws. So, uh, uh, Snell conjectured that the velocity is different and has... Uh, uh, derived mathematically this Snell law, and it uh, was in a very good agreement with, oh, and, and that's all. But I mean, this should be derivable from Maxwell equations, right? So that's, uh, so uh, I mean, th well, this is a postulate for you, right? So you're saying, well, we, we assume geometric optics minimize this time of arrival period, but this should be something which should be derived from Maxwell equations, should it not? Well, of course, it can be derived from the Hoyhans principle. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, of course. Yeah, later on, when people have understood the uh, wave nature of the and so on and so on, no, but at, at that moment it was just a conjecture. Yeah, in nineteenth century, for instance, nobody has seen any atom. However, there was a huge part of physics and chemistry based on this conjecture that there are atoms, particles, and so on and so on. Yeah, so this was just a physical conjecture. <clears throat> but I am talking here about mathematics. And men, uh, most of uh, scientists has um, agreed, uh, has taken this as, as as a proof that his conjecture was, and Fermat pushed it forward, namely, now X is just a X1, X2, and so on, X3. <clears throat> and this is nothing but a sum, the same sum as here, yeah? Something like L, E over V E, and because we know that the Snell law at each transition point means that when we fix all the uh, axes except just one, then the line is shortest one. And now, if we make this division finer and finer, we finally obtain such a uh, integral. And this is a heuristical proof that in a continuous case, we should minimize this quantity. And the interesting thing is that this is just one over v, um, which is position depending, and the square root of g, k, l. This is position depending, yeah, uh, d, x, k, d, x, l, which simply means that if we 
define such a fictitious metric tensor, which is one over V G K L, which is, uh, sorry, square, V square, because I must put it now, <laughs> which simply means that the uh, light uh, rays travel, travel over uh, shortest lines or geodesic line of this fictitious metric. <clears throat> okay. That's like 1621. So, 1621, not 61. It's not <clears throat> Yes. Sorry. 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 Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Excuse me. <clears throat> The next step was a brachistochrone problem. Uh, 16, this I know by heart, 96, Johannes Bernoulli. Bernoulli. I write his name because they have been four brothers Bernoulli, and this is that one who invented this problem. He, he invented this just as a, as a puzzle, which he sent to, uh, to, uh, to leading mathematicians of his uh, time as a challenge. Are you able to solve this problem? The, the, uh, these people, among others, because there are uh, probably uh, many more, but I remember three of them, Newton, Leibniz, and Delopital. Yeah. And all of them have solved this, uh, this problem, which I'm going to cite, namely, if you take such a profile and you put a ball here, then we are able to calculate the time of, uh, of arrival here. We put the ball with ve ve uh, initial ve velocity zero. Is there any profile such that the ball arrives faster? And especially, which profile is the best one from this point of view? Again, to find the shortest way. Yeah. And of course, like over there, we immediately see that it pays to first to put the ball very uh, almost um, vertically, because this way the ball will get quickly the velocity, and then even if this uh, path is uh, slightly longer, but velocity is much bigger. Therefore, it pays off. But of course, we cannot exaggerate. So there is some balance which must be found. OK. So this brachistochrone, the, the uh, shortest time curve, uh, at that time, people have used uh, names taken from Greek or Latin. So, brachisto, bra, to, chron. So, this optimal line. And this, this is, by the way, very nice exercise for uh, first year or second year calculus students. Those of you who uh, teach them calculus, I think it is very nice to consider this problem. Now, but the main personality, which, I, which uh, appears in my history, is Maupertuis, Pierre Louis de Maupertuis. Those of you who have studied, yeah, okay, all of you have studied classical mechanics, so you know probably Maupertuis variational principle. It is a principle for uh, trajectory and so on. 
Maupertuis was very much influenced by the optimistic um, um, Leibniz philosophy, which was related with the fundamental problem in philosophy. The fundamental problem, it is known in philosophical uh, literature as unde malum, where the evil comes from. Because if the God has created uh, the universe and the God is good, where there is so much evil? And the answer was roughly speaking like that, that some aspect, some aspects, <laughs> probably are not so good, the others are good, <clears throat> but there is a balance and the God has chosen the optimal word. Here, for instance, if you shorten the, li the line, which you improve some aspect, but the other aspect, namely velocity, will be worse. So the same choice, had a God when creating the universe. He had chosen the best of the world, uh, the best of possible words. And for that purpose, he has invented this name, least action, no, least action is probably later, but something was least, something was least. And the God in his, uh, yeah, has chosen the, the, the word when creating it in such a way that some, uh, some what? Um, functional assumes its least uh, value. Later on, on this uh, there have been slightly later because it was pr this was around 1750 roughly speaking immediately then people got interested in these problems and Euler and Lagrange a bit later and we are taught that the variational principle is equivalent to Euler-Lagrange equations. Everybody, everybody knows it. <clears throat> so, no, sorry. I have to. Okay. okay, so let me derive Euler Lagrange equation, which is a stupid thing because all of you have done it many times during your studies, but let me just derive it in order to point out some important things. So we assume that we have a, ah, of course the next step is Hamilton, sorry, excuse me, Hamilton, because Hamil uh, I will mainly discuss Hamilton variation and principle which is a generalization of Maupertuis. However, Maupertuis invention was fundamental, was fundamental. Just Hamilton has slightly broadened. The, okay, so let us come back to our century. So most of physics, uh, of theoretical physics is based on the Hamilton variational principle, which means that we have a Lagrangian density, which depends upon some fields and their derivatives. Okay, this is just abbreviation for the partial derivatives of K. Here, 
I use partial derivatives, not any uh, uh, covariant derivatives. At our, my time, when I was <clears throat> studying physics, not in this building, but in the other one, then using partial derivatives was a, something embarrassing, yeah? Yeah, embarrassing. Somebody who has used uh, partial derivative was treated, ah, he doesn't understand that real geometry is just, uh, <clears throat> is based on covariant derivatives and using only the uh, peasants use partial derivative. But here, no. And partial derivatives are legitimate operators. This is based only a few times later, a few years later, I noticed that there, there is a nice geometrical object which is described by partial derivatives, namely jets of sections and so on and so on. I am not entering into that because for our purposes, we may remain on a very basic um, level. Of course, those quantities <coughs> in physics very often are organized into some uh, vector, no, no, some bundle, geometric bundle. So these are values of our fields. And in mathematical language, they are uh, coordinates in each fiber of this, this bundle. And these are coordinates in the altogether, this is the first jet of a section of the, that bundle. Now, I will remain on the level of first order derivatives. However, it may be include also derivatives up to 10, or if you prefer 20, let it be 20. Everything goes in a similar way. However, there are some subtleties uh, which have to be taken into account. But today I'm going to stay on the level of first order principle. <coughs> Okay, so what we do, we consider a one parameter family of, of course, the physical field depends upon uh, position, yeah? But it depends also upon a, a parameter and we'll calculate derivative with respect to that parameter. I call it delta. So this is nothing by d over d, say, epsilon. Therefore, you have to understand that, that all those quantities depend upon position, physical position, which mathematically is a base of this fiber bundle. X mu and epsilon. Okay. Okay. And now, uh, you, you include time into X mu. Pardon? You include time into X mu. Time. Not only time, everything, yeah. time, position, and so on. This is a point of space time when it is. However, it may be just a, a chemical technology. Then it is mainly when we are interested in uh, equilibrium processes, then there are only positions and so on and so on. It, it may also be one dimensional. Then this is just a classical mechanics. And let me calculate the derivatives of this quantity at a single point. So what is it? <clears throat> so it is dl over d phi k times derivative of phi with respect to epsilon, which is simply phi k, and also the 
there is also epsilon here, therefore, plus dl over d derivatives times delta phi k mu. But this you remember is a second, it is a derivative with respect to uh, space time parameters. This, but the second derivatives are, are symmetric. Therefore, I may write down it that this is d mu uh, delta phi k. Yeah. Sometimes this uh, commutation in old books is called fundamental principle of calculus of variation, but here you see it is nothing especially exciting. Just second derivatives are symmetric. Therefore, we may integrate by part. Yeah, we may integrate by part. So finally, we obtain dl over d phi k minus the d mu dl over d phi k mu and this is multiplied by delta phi k and moreover we have this total divergence which I will write this way d mu <coughs> dl over d phi k mu delta phi now, the philosophy of, of all these uh, people was the following, that this formula we use when we, uh, by integrating, yeah? So we divide the action. If this talk had been given 100 years ago, I would, probably be forced to use le the letter V because at that time physics was almost entirely German science. So action was called Wirkung, but nowadays, <laughs> but in many books, uh, action is still called W. Okay, but no, this is an action, which is related with some space-time volume, which is defined as a integral over O uh, of L. Now, most of you would protest because would say, no, 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 you must, if you integrate, you must choose. Uh, so something like D for X should be there. No, no, because this, has already, already uh, integrated into L. L is not a scalar function which you integrate, but it is a density. Of course, if you choose a system of coordinates, you may always write it as a product of a certain scalar times, times D for X, but I fr from the very beginning, I assumed that L is not a scalar, but a scalar density. Therefore, the integral does not depend upon the choice of <coughs> coordinate. Okay. And the philosophy is the following, that we are looking for minimum or stationary point with a condition that the boundary has been fixed. Yeah, so if we calculate, so delta A delta is equal integral over O of this Euler-Lagrange. These are Euler-Lagrange equations, so I will multiply it by delta. Phi a, uh, phi k, plus an integral of the 
total divergence four dimensional four dimensional if we think about uh, field theory therefore it will be we may change it to a boundary integral due to stock theorem and uh, let me just introduce this notation which is very often Sorry, I am not, oh, <laughs> uh, which I will use because it pays, it really pays to use this philosophy, namely this quantity, let me call P. And what is this quantity? First of all, <laughs> position of indices. Of course, something which is up, in the denominator, it means that in fact it is down. Yeah, therefore P has an index here and mu is up. Yeah. So this this object is nothing but D mu P K mu delta phi K. At the moment, it is just a, a notation, but it is very important. One of the, yeah, so this will be P, K, and I will write this way, orthogonal with respect to the boundary. Yeah? Times delta phi K. And now the story goes like that. There is no neither uh, minimum nor stationary point uh, altogether. However, if we fix the boundary, there is the boundary values, which means that phi k at the boundary is fixed, which means that we move ourselves within the, uh, a subspace of those con field configurations which fulfill this boundary, then the delta of P within this family vanishes, yeah? So any, if we fix boundary condition, then, and this way, this, integral drops out and now to find a stationary point or the minimum is just to find where it is zero now this is this must be zero for any delta pi fulfilling boundary conditions but doesn't matter it immediately implies that this must be equal to zero and we are happy. We have now already in 30s, uh, physicists, but I'm sure that intelligent physicists had realized this uh, much earlier that, of course, in uh, dynamical theories, there is no minimum that the Maupertuis. Uh, <coughs> terminology list action is absolutely false because it is not a um, stationary uh, minimal point but a stationary point by the way a lot of mathematical effort has been done also in uh, last century for instance there is a book beautiful book by Gelfand and who Oh, Fomin, Gelfand and Fomin on a variational calculus, and their effort goes towards the uh, su uh, sufficient condition because uh, this equals zero is a necessary condition for a minimum. But of course, people who are working in economy or in uh,
all of them who try to optimize something. Then they are not happy with fulfilling only uh, necessary conditions. Uh, they would like to know whether it is really a minimum. And a, a very nice mathematical effort was done in, in this direction. But for us, it is irrelevant because for us who are interested, I mean, for those of us who are interested in dynamical theories, we know that there is ne never minimum. Just take, for instance, um, harmonic oscillator. And it is ju just an uh, interesting, uh, very simple example to prove that this stationary point is not a minimum, but it is a saddle point. It is st just stationary point because there are, uh, there are deformations of a trajectory which uh, improve. Uh, yeah, this way, and they are different, which uh, for which the action is bigger. Okay, in any case, when this, so instead of a least action principle, we, in fact, have stationary action principle. And this stationary action principle was a basis of for, uh, for um, Feynman, Feynman integrals, this uh, stationary action, uh, which gives most uh, contribution to the quantum and so on and so on. You, you know, it's stationary action. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saddle point matters. Yeah, yeah. This is very important. Also, WKB is based on that. And, and so, yeah. In any case, this is, yeah. Therefore, we, people have a tendency to say, I calculate the variation of the Lagrangian, I split it into two parts. This part drops out, it is irrelevant. So the only thing which we have is this part. This part is volume part and the boundary part. So people have a tendency to kill the boundary part and to concentrate on the volume part. Okay, so let us see what, how does it work, for instance, I will show you that it is a nonsense. Such an approach in hyperbolical theories is a nonsense. Although, although, of course, it is a no. Sorry, ah, sorry I am not sufficiently intelligent or sufficiently trained. Or, however, two years ago I had that. Uh, I kept a lecture for students of the third years, and at that time I was very well trained in in this machinery, but I forgot my my training. Okay, so let us apply this for a simple hyperbolical. However, I stress that this is a perfect and legitimate approach in logistic or if people try to uh, construct uh, for the traffic engineers if they try to construct in warsaw the green waves yeah green waves they have to minimize something yeah and they solve this problem and all this technique is perfect Namely, the boundary term is irrelevant. The only uh, part which counts is the, the, the volume part. Now, let me 
take the wave uh, equation and even in two dimension my personal almost 60 almost 60 year uh, experience is that if you are trying to say something about for instance i don't know gravitational waves or something check how your technique works in the case of uh, wave equation wave equation is a mother of any hyperbolic equations all the uh, phenomena can be checked so let us check how does it work for a wave equation in wave equation lagrangian is equal minus one half uh, g mu nu uh, d mu phi d nu phi there is one because i have i prefer to use minus plus 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 um, convention of course those of you who are mainly working with spinners probably prefer the opposite but i am mainly working with gravitational uh, energy and considering space like geometry with three minuses is very unpleasant so i prefer this which simply means that and now x to be uh, to simplify my example let us choose just two dimensional minkowski space namely uh, t which is x zero and x that's it. yeah two dimension so this is nothing but one two and there is phi dot square minus phi prime square whereby dot i re, uh, so phi dot is d over d t phi and prime phi prime is d over d x phi okay so you you perfectly know that uh, Euler Lagrange equations is just a two dimensional wave equation, very often called string equation, which is nothing but, well, let me check which convention I used. Um, yeah, okay. D2 over dx square minus D2 over dt square phi equal zero and you know how to solve every solution is a superposition of uh, right going and left going signals and well, you know it but this equation may be nicely rewritten uh, in terms of the uh, light coordinates so much beloved by Eurek, for instance and indeed it helps very much in many circles so let us choose coordinates u equal x plus t v equal x minus t and now um, d over dt is can be expressed in terms of those yeah it is a some combination of d over du plus d over dv and what are the coefficients of course du over dt and the coefficient here is dv sorry dv over dt and du over dt is one and this is all the and and this is minus so it is nothing but yeah d over d u minus d over d v 
I use my notes but because sometimes <laughs> it is di difficult not to make some error in the sign. So, <laughs> okay. And the same for d over dx. Recently, I had uh, been asked to uh, make a referee of some paper and a, a friend of mine, a very good theoretical physicist, has written an, an enthusiastic uh, report, a very good paper. And then Kasia Grabowska, whom you know, has checked. And of course, it is very good, with only exception that it is a, an, a, an error of sign and a certain point, which totally ruins the uh, conclusions. <laughs> Therefore, but Kasia uh, has written that these problems of sign is a common problem of us, the theoreticians. Of course, so I try to avoid this problem. Uh, so again, it can be this vector because the derivative is a vector may be expressed in a new basis, yeah, namely d over du plus d over dv. Sorry, yeah, yeah. but at each point it is a vector, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are right. You are, you are right. But at each point, it is a vector. Therefore, and the coefficients are du over dx. Uh, and here, dv over dx. And uh, both coefficients are plus 1. Therefore, this is d over du plus d over dv. And finally, this operator, the wave operator, is nothing but Let me call this operator uh, following Einstein. Of course, it is stupid because Einstein used it because it is a four-dimensional Laplacian. This is not four-dimensional, but, but two-dimensional. But excuse me. And square is also two-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so this two-dimensional D'Alembertian is nothing by d over du plus d over dv square minus d over du minus d over dv square. And this is a nice exercise in elementary school that squares will cancel and what remains is uh, twice uh, the product so all together we will have four times second derivatives of d u d v okay and now this imp uh, this enables us to uh, rewrite this field equation in a very nice geometric way. Namely, whenever I have a rectangle in these variables, what is a rectangle? Yeah, rectangle is just something like that. Yeah. Okay. So this means that let me go back to my, so here, here, um, this line is u equal some quantity, say one, and this u equal b, whereas constant line of the variable v are there, so let me call this line v, no, this line, v equal, 
Ah, no, no, no. V equals C, V equals D. Yeah? So, and let, so, so let us call this rectangle uh, O. So the integral of this rectangle, oh, um, if I, I calculate uh, from, I will just, yeah, from A to B, D, U, from C to D, D, V, this, this quantity, yeah, so rectangle of, U equals zero instead of U equals A. This is A. No, 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 that's of the picture. Ah, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Of this, which is zero. So what happens if the function fulfills this uh, the wave equation. So instead of that, I put four, I drop four because four, yeah? so it is second derivatives of, um, of psi with respect to d, du, dv. So this is nothing but a, b, D, U, and here I have first derivative because we obtain at the point U and V is uh, D. Minus d phi of u c d u. Now again you integrate, so you finally get the value of phi at four points. May, let me call these points a. These four corners. B, C, and D. So it is obvious that you clearly obtain phi at uh, A plus phi of the opposite. What is opposite? C minus phi of B minus phi of D. Okay, now, every solution of wave equation fulfills this, but the opposite is also uh, true. It is very easy, I drop the uh, proof. Everybody of you may easily prove it, that whenever you have a function on a plane, which fulfills this equation, this identity for any rectangle in variables u and v, then this function fulfills wave equation. Okay, so now, if, now let me <coughs> apply this. Sorry? Does it hold in five dimensions? No, no, in, five di in four dimensions it is slightly different, but I, I will comment on that. Let, let me finish this, this example. No, no, it is not such a simple, but... Okay, so suppose we want to apply this philosophy, I will call it Brachistochrone philosophy. Let me... so. 
try to apply this brachistochrone philosophy to this problem. But you see, so first step in this brachistochrone philosophy is to impose boundary conditions. But, and later on, you derive field equations. So suppose you first impose boundary conditions. So now you check, does this boundary condition fulfills this identity? If no, there is no solution. Moreover, the uh, set of, if you wish the, wish, the space of those boundary conditions which admit solution is very small. Oh, here it is very easy. In this particular example, it is very easy because you know that if you have imposed boundary condition on three walls, then this is already given. But if you choose, for instance, something where this is niewspółmierny i jakieś Yeah, where this wall is incommensurable in with that, then you see that it never closes, but you will have something like infinite, <laughs> infinite uh, identity, which is difficult, very difficult to, uh, to analyze. But the situation is still not as bad. But if you uh, take at random the uh, volume U, then the situation is really very, very bad. Because the set of all boundary conditions which admit any solution is very small. Uh, mathematicians have um, is of first category with respect to the second category. In poor words, it is, I would summarize the situation in the following. If you just put the boundary data at random, then the probability that there exists any solution is zero, precisely zero. Therefore, my conclusion would be, you may accept it or reject, whatever you wish. However, my personal conclusion is the following. No. Okay. Oh. My personal conclusion is the following. And this is very standard situation. Even if you take our old uh, um, oscillator. So it is obvious when you uh, take an interval of time, which is a multiple of a period, then you cannot uh, freely assume boundary conditions because the position here must be equal to that and also the momentum and so on and so on. It is very nice example. However, in mechanics, we may say, ah, but it is relatively seldom situation. But in field theory, it is not seldom. It is just the standard. Standard situation is that if you wish to reject this and next derive field equations from that time, first, you must know field equations, because otherwise you get nothing. There are no uh, solutions. Therefore, the procedure of deriving field equations where we first must know already those field equations is a nonsense. 
My conclusion is the following. Instead of neglecting this and concentrating on that, so I come back to my fundamental formula, which I am analyzing there, here is this formula. The derivative of the Lagrangian decomposed into two uh, components, into two terms, the volume term and the boundary term. So the procedure, which I would call brachistochrone procedure, which works perfectly for elliptic problems. And those, all those engineers, traffic engineers who are constructing green waves in Warsaw may legitimately use this procedure. For us, the physicists who are trying to describe fundamental laws of nature is absolutely useless. Okay, and my, does it mean that Euler-Lagrange equations are false and we have to throw away books? No, no. Euler-Lagrange equations are correct, but there must be derived in a completely different way. Instead of neglecting that, whenever I neglect, this is an uh, identity. There is no information here. This is an identity. Where I neglect this, this becomes an equation. And this equation, but I will keep that and neglect that part, which in poor words means that I am working on shell. I am not interested in those jets of fields in those field configurations which do not fulfill field equations. No, I am interested only in those who fulfill. Therefore, for me, this is equal zero a priori. And now this becomes an equation. So let me now try to analyze what happens in, in such an approach. So this is, uh, Paradox, I will never use that. So field equations, so whenever I have a Lagrangian, again, which depends upon fields and their derivatives. So there is a, a notion of a momentum canonically conjugate. And these objects, which I have used here as merely an abbreviation for something, I will call them P, K, mu. What are those? From the point of view of the values or field values, they are just covectors. But they have an extra, uh, an extra uh, index and in mathematical terms, but I'm not going to go very deeply into that mathematics. They are covectors on each fiber of this bundle, but not with values in scalars, but in vector densities on space-time. Everybody who wants to deepen his um, geometrical understanding may easily find all the explanations in papers, books, and so on. And the field equations are written in this way. So this is a standard way to write down field equations, which is because these derivatives on the left hand side. Oh, sorry, sorry, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, sorry, excuse me. Which is nothing. Ah, uh -huh. by the way, oh, at this point, I would probably just put D. Now, what is the difference between D and delta? I, I in, 
I have published some papers and sometimes I prefer to use D, sometimes delta. But at this very point, it is nothing but just derivative. We, however, we stand at a single chosen point of space time. The independent variables are field strengths and its derivatives. And this is just the standard uh, derivative. And now, of course, this acts either on the first size, so d mu p k mu d phi k, or it acts on the second part, plus p k mu d, and of course, d mu enters here, phi mu, uh, phi k mu. So the function is a function on the first jet of section of, of this primary uh, but on the other hand, we have the uh, those momenta and their derivatives. So you can say say that finally here we have first jet of of the uh, of the section of this fiber bundle where our field configurations are described. And you may say, then, and this is nothing but the first jet of those momenta, but not exactly. Why? Because the first jet contains all possible derivatives. And here we have only some combination, so a little bit less. So it is some uh, generalized jet, some equivalence relations between all the jets. But in any case, you see that it is just nothing but a control theory. You have uh, control parameters, the generating function, and you have the response parameters. And this equation means nothing, but first of all, the derivative of this Lagrangian to this parameter is equal to, yeah, so this equation is p k mu equal d l over d phi k mu, whereas the derivative with respect to this parameter is written here. Therefore, d mu p k mu is equal d l over d phi k. <clears throat> But please observe that when you plug this equation into that, so you obtain simply Euler-Lagrange equation. Therefore, Euler-Lagrange equation are still valid this way. However, we have something more. Namely, we have sec first order uh, equations for a bigger set of Sometimes we prefer to have second order derivatives for calculational reasons. However, I believe that physically it is very, very nice to have this description because in most cases which we deal in physics, this quantity is a very important ingredient of the geometrical description of the physical field which we, which we deal with. So I prefer this version. Therefore, I may say the following, that this that the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations can be derived from this symplectic 
generating formula. By the way, in physics, you have a lot of such generating formulae. For instance, I remind you in classical thermodynamics, you have the generating formula, which is minus P dV plus T dS. Yeah. And you treat the internal uh, internal energy as a function of control parameters, namely the volume and the entropy. And this equation means nothing, but if I know the generating function, namely how the internal energy depends upon the volume and the entropy, I know already everything. The entire physics of, of this body is already known, namely minus P is the derivative of U with respect to P and T is the, and so on and so on. However, these techniques enables a lot of, I prepared, prepared much more examples, but I see that my time is, comes to the end, so I will skip more examples. <laughs> of course, the, okay, I will skip more examples. In any case, this techniques is very, very useful for, uh, for the purposes, for the fundamental purposes, because we may exchange the role of control and uh, response. For instance, you know that if you write this as uh, minus d p v plus v d p, and then you put this on the other side, then you obtain the free energy, which is also an extremely important generating function in, in different circumstances. Yeah, when you uh, discuss uh, adiabatic processes is very useful to use that, but if you discuss thermo, uh, the, if you put your body into thermal bath, it is much better to consider the other thing. Yeah, not this is for energy. Ah, uh, no, excuse me. Yes, of course, if script. this is enthalpy. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, free energy, yeah, 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 excuse me. The free energy is if I exchange T with that. Excuse me, excuse me, because I am a little bit <laughs> uh, excited because my time is coming to the end, so I must somehow go to the end, and I will. Uh, uh -huh. And for example, general relativity is a beautiful example of uh, the superiority of this approach over the standard approach. Why? Because in general relativity, we do not have only one geometrical quantity which characterizes um, space time geometry, namely metric. Of course, metric is a legitimate quantity, very important, but we have also another one, namely the connection. And in the present version of general relativity, we assume a priori a certain relation between the metric and the connection. But of course, this is one of the equations. This is, I would say, this equation. We assume a priori this equation because the metric and the connection are mutually, um, are mutually um, complement. complement, yeah. And of course, it is a legitimate problem to use metric and its derivatives as a, a control parameters, and then we will have a connection as a response. We may do it in such a way that this 
is just a, a standard. Which, but I don't believe this is a fundamental law of nature. Of course, in our galaxy, let me <laughs> say, we observe that probably, indeed, the, the connection is the metric one. But general relativity was invented as a extension of the Newton's gravity law from um, the scale of the Earth and slightly more to the scale of our uh, solar system and it works perfectly. However, to extend it, its present version, to the uh, scale of uh, the universe is still another extension by 20 orders of, mag of uh, magnitude, roughly speaking, and it never happened in general in uh, history of humanity that such an extension is possible. Therefore, I treat present uh, cosmology as of course, it is a legitimate thing to extend the theory and try to find the, the consequences, but it is just a mathematical exercise, legal, but don't expect that this is, has anything to do with real physics. So. So I end up with this, uh, with our advertising my, my approach that there is much more room in this approach and it does not lead to, to those absolutely crazy uh, situation then in order to derive field equations, we have to know it before which is a, an, uh, which is a paradox which I do not accept. So I drop out a lot of things. Ah, the next part of my talk had been the so-called, uh, <clears throat> But I, I will not go into details, but let me just tell you an advertisement for the, <laughs> for the next uh, part, which will be uh, dropped out. So the next um, part, I would like to discuss the Netter theorem, which very often is considered as a basis to understand general relativity because it provides the right hand side for Einstein equations and so on. In my opinion, Netter theorem is absolutely useless in general relativity because in, I have only two cases where Netter theorem gives a correct uh, energy momentum tensor. One example is a scalar field, and the second example is a mm, continuous media. However, in order to have that, you have to be clever. You have to be clever. But already in uh, electromagnetism, uh, Noether's theorem gives you energy momentum tensor, which is neither uh, symmetric nor equal to the energy because we know what is energy of the electromagnetic field and there is no doubt ab about that. So uh, I wanted to discuss that but I will skip and at the very end my plan but I see now that it was completely stupid to have this plan because it I would extend this talk uh, on two hours and a half probably, so I will skip, but only let me tell you that the last part would be the discussion 
how does it work in electrodynamics? In electrodynamics, because in ele <coughs> electrodynamics, when you there are apparently problems with with uh, constraints and so on. But observe that on the level before you uh, integrate something, because people always uh, say, ah, let us pass to the Hamiltonian picture. In the Hamiltonian picture, we exchange time derivatives with the corresponding momenta, and we kill the boundary part, but now not four-dimensional boundary, but three-dimensional boundary, by imposing boundary conditions. This is legal. Imposing four-dimensional boundary conditions is illegal, but imposing three-dimensional boundary condition, it is not only legal, but necessary to make the uh, evolution uh, unique. Or in physical terms, to make the uh, field which is inside this three-dimensional volume and a closed Hamiltonian system. Okay, so then you have those constraints that the divergence of the electric field might be zero. And then there are those problems, those Lagrange coefficients, which are, is so complicated. Recently, I had a discuss with a very uh, good theoretical physicist, a colleague of ours, who was shocked that uh, those um, that those um, constraints are those constraints are um, arise when you integrate something over three dimensional volume. Yeah, so you derive this Hamiltonian density and you integrate over three-dimensional volume, you say, ah, this is nothing but the energy contained in V. Very good. However, then you deal with infinite dimensional phase space. My uh, advice is rather not integrate rather try to analyze the story point by point of course it is legitimate to integrate and to consider infinite dimensional system but then it is much much more difficult because you deal with infinite dimensional spaces and the um, the evolution operator which is not uh, which is an unbounded operator. Those unbounded operators uh, yeah. Banach has invented Banach space in order to deal with partial differential equations. And we are teaching uh, students in the second years how nice it is that all the theorems from finite dimensional space apply also in infinite. But it is cheating because it works only when this operator is uh, bounded or continuous. But in our, uh, in real physics, the, those operators are mainly um, Laplacians, and it is not an bounded operator. There is a lot of uh, work to do in order to give uh, appropriate uh, self-adjoint uh, self uh, extension to, to that, and this is difficult. Of course, it, it can be done, but when discussing physical properties, but, but it is not simple which means that if you want to analyze the real infinite dimensional uh, dynamics of the field, you must be aware of the fact that there, there is a lot of hard 
functional analytical problems. But most of, of the uh, consequences may be derived on this level, finite dimensional level. There are, okay, thank you very much. Excuse me for extending a little. Hello, do I take? Oh. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, perhaps uh, we, we have time for, for a couple of questions. So perhaps we start with the people who are online. Are there any questions from you? This is this uh, Jacek Tafel speaking. This is not a question, but all, only I would like to apologize that I am not there. So I'm sorry that I didn't come, but I was not able because of some. Uh, we are sorry that you are not with us. Yeah, perhaps next time. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a remark which is on the black. So yeah. Maybe because you said okay, take this Lagrangian, take this spiral of a space-time point. Uh, yeah. Then we have a certain stuff. But you know those equations are interpreted as a Lagrangian submicron with yeah. a certain yeah. symmetric yeah. structure, which is even explicitly not solved. But the thermodynamics, it's a different story. You cannot, you have no symplectic structure, you have contact structure, which is different. So you cannot put all that this is similar. This is different story. No, no. But of course, you have... the contact structure may be also interpreted as, of course. as a symplectic structure in the higher dimension. Yeah, of course. But on this left, it's a contact. No, no, no. But I understand. The, the symplectic space is four-dimensional, and I treat th this of I understand. space of thermodynamic value. So you cannot say that this is for It can be, yeah, I agree. It can be formulated this way, but it can also be formulated in the way I like it, namely four-dimensional space, and this is the, uh, yeah. This contact, Formulation is useful, I agree, but for, for, for certain purposes, it is useful. But for my purposes, it is useless. Okay. <laughs> no, no, because you have not only potential which come from, from this, but you can divide by all. Yes, yes. I can Yes, I agree. Potentials, etc. And all this geometry is the same. It's a circumstance. Okay, I agree. Are there any more questions? I, 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 I would have a question. So uh, uh, suppose that we have higher order system, not second, not Lagrangian, not of the second order, uh, like uh, of the first order, but of higher order. So uh, is this theory also applied there or? Yeah. Yes, it works perfectly. My answer is the following. I have written a couple of papers. There is one paper where everything is written. Yeah, roughly speaking, the poor man explanation is the following. If you have here uh, derivatives up to 10, for instance, then you, as a configuration bundle, you take a, a space of ninth jets of the section. So the 10th derivative is just the first derivative of all derivatives up to nine. So this is, but then there are some technical problems because the, there will be some constraint in this, but it is easy to solve. Everything is well explained in my paper. Thank you. I think we should stop because no. let me add just one more sentence. And what I didn't tell you is how we pass from the Lagrangian to Hamiltonian picture. And um, uh, I believe that the Hamiltonian 
the correct Hamiltonian formulation of a, a theory which contains more derivatives in the Lagrangian is relatively well, uh, less known, but it works perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.